Hello, everybody. Great to see everyone. Um, guys, sorry that this took a little, oh wait, this is recording. Okay, great. Hey everyone, welcome to Bible study. Great to see y'all. Um, I wanted to make a couple announcements before we dive into God's word together. Um, first off, does everyone have the handout? Great, 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 great. Okay, uh, we've got extras at different tables, so just let me know. Um, second thing I was going to say, y'all just be cool and act normal, but I've got some friends from Sanford in the back and they're taking a video of me for their website, obviously because I'm so awesome, but it'll be great because South Island's going to be featured as well just a little bit, so pretend like they're not there. It'll be great, uh, but I wanted to let y'all know. So um, the other thing I was going to say is I hope that all of y'all received an email from me with the recording from last week. If you didn't, let me know, and feel free to forward that to anybody or let me know if anyone wants to be added to the list. So I'm going to go ahead and pray for us, and we can get started, and uh, we'll review what, we, what we've been talking about. So let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for the gift of community that you've given us here at South Highland. Lord, we pray that you would be with us now as we open up your word to study it. Lord, would you reveal yourself to us and God, we pray that you'd bless this food and our conversation and our time together. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we've been talking about 1 Corinthians 15. What is the resurrection and why does it matter? Uh, because as we kind of talked about last week, you know, Easter happens and we're like, yay, we can, we can check that off. We can post the pictures and move on to the next holiday. Um, but we want to be a little bit more mindful of of the fact that Jesus stepped out of the tomb 2,000 years ago. This was a historical event, a day in history that happened, and it affects the way that we live today. So the question that we're sort of asking is, how do we now live in light of the resurrection? How do we, as Christians, say we are Easter peoples? And so this was actually really hilarious. This happened last week. Like right after our Bible study, I was in bed with Eleanor, and I can't remember. She said she didn't feel good, and I was like, all right, let's pray about it. She goes, Mom, and then she's three. She goes, Mom, Jesus isn't going to answer my prayers. He died on the cross. And I was like, okay, what a great teaching opportunity. Um, yes, all true, but he's alive, Eleanor. He's not dead. He's alive, and he's in this room with us right now. And she was like, I don't know. So we, we got to kind of have a conversation about that. But I, I did think that was pretty funny. That happened like right after we started studying this. What a great opportunity to tell Eleanor he is not dead. He is surely alive. And um, he can answer your prayers. Please do not fret. So that was a good little moment of comfort for her. So let's go ahead and um, dive into this passage. I'm going to grab one of the sheets. And we are going to actually read this in um, sections. So remember that the Greeks thought that the spirit world was, uh, that the, the afterlife was like a spirit world, and it was a good thing to be released from your body, that death was a good thing. Um, meanwhile, the Jews knew that death was the product of the fall, a fallen world. It was something that was not natural in our world. And um, so what, what Jesus is saying, well, what Paul's saying in this passage is that, yes, the Jews are right. Death is awful. And we try to sugarcoat it a lot, especially in Southern culture, right? Um, you know, God just needed another angel. That's a horrible thing to say to someone who's lost a loved one. Or, you know, everything happens for a reason. And so if you've lost someone, you know how extremely unhelpful these words are in the, in the pinnacle of your grief. And what Paul is saying here is, is yeah, that's, if, if death is all there is, then that's absolutely tragic. Um, but there's actually hope, even in the midst of the worst thing that can happen to us, which is to die. And so that's what we're going to read together today. Today's passage is going to help us see the real difference that Christ's resurrection makes in our lives. So we're going to start in verse 12, and we're just going to read 12 through 19, talk about it, and then we'll go in sections from there. So y'all grab your sheets. Listen, for this is God's word. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. 
More than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Uh, this is something really, really clever that Paul is doing. And it's funny, uh, I've been reflecting on how my math degree makes me a good minister. I don't know if y'all knew I studied math in school. And this passage actually made me think of this. There's something in math when you're doing proofs, and y'all can, y'all can fact check me with Rick Ackerson, another math major at Stanford. Um, but there's this thing that you can do when you're trying to prove something in math where you assume the opposite is true. So you assume what's untrue is true, and then you start to kind of work backwards, and you realize you get some sort of contradiction, some sort of mathematical contradiction al- ar- along the way, and it proves that the other thing has to be true. Does that make sense? And so that's what Paul's doing here. He's saying, okay, let's assume that Jesus Christ has not been raised. So it's clear, if you look at verse 12, there's clearly an issue of some sort with Christians at the time. They, uh, in Corinth, they had written Paul a letter, remember, with a couple of questions. And so Paul's saying, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? So it sounds like there are actual Christians inside the church saying, you know, resurrection of the dead, that's a little far-fetched too miraculous of a miracle, let's go with something a little bit more basic. That make it, might make us a little bit more attractive to other people. And Paul is saying, okay, so let's assume that's true. Let's assume there is no resurrection of the dead. Let's assume that really is impossible, with or without the Spirit of God. And so a couple of implications come from this. The big thing, obviously, is not even Christ has been raised. If there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is truly dead, much like Eleanor thought. He died on the cross, the end, and the disciples just live on to keep on his memory. It's a memorial faith. If y'all were here on Easter Sunday, that's what Pastor Sam said, a memorial faith. And so now Paul says there's four implications, four major consequences if Christ has not been raised from the dead. So y'all have been, listen carefully and look at the text because this, this is all about our Christian faith right here. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, the first thing is that everything we're preaching is useless. And our faith is useless. It means how pitiful that Court, Abby, and Sam are making a living out of teaching a lie, preaching a lie. Like, what a waste. And how lame is it that all of y'all have gathered here on a Tuesday and that you come up here on a Sunday and we're going to just play act a resurrected Christ? That would be pretty pitiful, right? If if Christ was not risen from the dead. And Paul, if that kind of makes you feel a little like, ooh, then Paul, that's what Paul's going for. We'll see that at the end of the passage. He uses this word shame. He wants us to feel like, ugh, like what? That makes me feel weird. The second thing is that we're going around and sharing a lie. What does it say in verse 14? It says, uh, oh, it says our preaching is useless. But verse 15, more than that, we are false witnesses about God. So if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead and we're going around preaching resurrection, then we're just lying to everybody, not just to ourselves, but actively trying to deceive other people. That's not great. The third thing, and this one's like really not great, is, oh, by the way, if Christ has not been risen from the dead, then you're still in your sins. Because the atoning death that happened on the cross is worthless if Jesus did not actually overcome death on the cross. Do you see that? If Good Friday happened and there was no Easter, then it's really just a beautiful sacrificial story, but with no actual living hope that comes from that. So there's this, there's this great song, I think Hillsong sings it right now, and, and um, not right now, they sing it, and I've been listening to it, um, and I, I can't even remember what the song's called, but there's this part where it says, death could not hold him. And so here's what they say. Death could not hold you. They're singing to Jesus. The veil tore before, before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. This is what they're describing what happened when Jesus was resurrected. Death could not hold you. 
So what we see in the resurrection is victory over sin and victory over death. And so if Jesus did not raise, was not raised from the dead, Paul is saying the Corinthians are just totally wasting their time. And there's one more implication if the resurrection is, is not true. He says in verse 18, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. And think of what this would mean for people in Corinth who have lost family and friends. Some of them have been martyred. And Paul is saying, if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, then they're just, they've just been lost. It was for nothing. And I love how he says, well, sort of, but it's also depressing. We are of all people to be pitied. And I hope what, what I've just described for you, all these implications of, of a metaphorical resurrection versus a literal one, I hope that makes you feel pretty depressed. It makes me feel pretty depressed. It's a grim outlook. It's sort of like, oh my, it should make you say, okay, what are we doing? If Christ was not raised from the dead, if we don't actually believe this happened, then what are we doing? And that's what Paul wants us to see as well. Uh, there's one more thing. Does anyone know, just shout it out if you know, what we call funerals here at South Island? Yeah, we call them witness to the resurrection services. We don't call them funerals. Isn't that really powerful? What we're saying when we have a funeral is that a funeral is not just a time to grieve, although grief is such an important part of losing someone in the Christian faith. We are sad. Death is not normal. It is not okay. We grieve. But at these services, what we do is we bear witness to the resurrection, to the hope we have in Jesus Christ, and the very real fact that one day we will see these brothers and sisters again if they are also in Christ. So that's the first section. We're going to read now verses 20 through 28. So Paul says, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, you should feel really dumb and you're pitiful, right? We're all pitiful. That's what he says. He's a great motivational speaker. And then we start in verse 20. And here's the good news, y'all. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him so that God may be all in all. All right, so y'all bear with me a little bit. This is a little Trinitarian stuff. We're not going to get too much in the details, but I want to point out first this phrase, first fruits, right? He is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. This means that everything Christ has experienced, we will also experience. Christ is the first fruits. And, and just in case he's not clear about that, Paul gives us this example of Adam, right? So y'all think about how we talk about Adam, right? Adam was the first man. Adam's the one where it all went wrong. And as a result, we are, we are sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, right? And so we live in sin. We're born into sin the same because of Adam, right? And so Paul is saying the same way you've heard your whole life that that is the human condition is the same way that one day your human condition will be that of Jesus. So y'all just let that soak in for a little bit. Think about how much we talk about Genesis 3, how much we talk about the fall. And Jesus, Paul is saying that one day, we will be more associated with Jesus Christ. We will look more like Jesus Christ than we look like Adam. 
In fact, there will be almost no signs of Adam other than the redeemed Adam. That's who Jesus is. Oh, I just love this. It feels like Narnia, right? If you've read the Narnia books, it just it just has like these vibes. That's what they call um, the, the children in Narnia are sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. And it just makes me think about uh, that's who we are as humans. And one day we will truly only be associated with Jesus Christ. And so that's what he's saying, the first fruit. So think about everything Jesus went through. Um, everything that Jesus' body did. Jesus ate. We see so many um, so many illustrations, uh, so many stories in the New, Test- the New Testament and the Gospels after the resurrection of Jesus eating. So I'm pretty excited about that because I love food. So I'm glad that my resurrected body will be able to enjoy food. Um, Jesus ha- like has a physical, physical body that Thomas touches. He touches the wounds. So I'm not, I don't know how it's all going to work out in detail, but what Paul is saying is Jesus is the first fruits, the first sign. Um, you, think about, you think about a garden. Um, if you scatter a bunch of seeds in your garden and you don't know what was in the mixed wildflower bag, the first fruits are going to tell you this is what the rest of the plant's going to look like. And that's what Jesus is for us, y'all. So Jesus is the first fruits. The other thing that this section says that's pretty exciting is that he will defeat all enemies, including death. And so what this, this whole passage really, if y'all could, if you wanted to sum up this middle passage, I would say this is what the resurrection means for our future, right? So for our future, we're going to have these awesome bodies. Um, it's actually one of Court's pet peeves. Y'all can, y'all can now be on the lookout for this. When you're at a funeral, and someone points to the to the casket and says, you know, that's not so and so's body, um, or that's not so and so. That's just their body, and and it bothers court because of this. Because one day that person's body, they're going to come right back to the body when when Jesus comes back on that final day, and that's what Paul is talking about here, a little bit. So when the end comes, we're gonna we're going to get new bodies like Christ, the first fruits. But then the other thing is that he is going to ultimately, uh, what does it say in verse 24? When the end comes, he will hand over the kingdom to God the Father. Whew, yes. After he's destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. Just evil is gone. Christ has done battle against it, and it's totally, totally done. And he will reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. That reminds us, hopefully, if you were here last week, that Isaiah 25 passage says he will swallow up death forever. He will swallow up the funeral shroud that's hovering over the people. And and this is what Paul is reminding us of. And he gets into a little bit of Trinitarian um, theology here when he says that Jesus will hand it over to the Father. And what, just, I don't want to get too much in the weeds here, because the Trinity is confusing to me anytime, it's confusing to all of us, but saying God will be all in all is what that passage ends with. And so what I think, the best way to describe this is, a lot of people talk about this day, they use the word consummation, the consummation of resurrection, the, the joining together of, of all that Christ has been working towards. All that God has been working towards happens on this final day when Jesus puts an end to evil. And he has final dominion over every possible sphere of creation. There are lots of scholars that talk about this creation. Um, If you hear about creation theology, the idea that, and I think Romans, Paul talks about it in Romans, but creation itself will be set free from the bondage of, of, of sin. Like, you know, Trees, I mean, trees are awesome. Flowers are awesome. Nature is so great. Think about what the Grand Canyon is going to be like in a redeemed, sinless world. Like, it's pretty cool right now. But, but what God is saying is there's one day coming where everything will be submitted to the king of heaven, where the kingdom will be reunited. Again, this idea of consummation, it will all be gathered up together, reunited uh, the way that I like to think of it is if you, um, you never play like a game of solitaire and you get to the end and there's like that moment where you're like, okay, 
Like, all I'm doing is just putting the cards in the right places. That's what Jesus is saying. Uh, that's what Paul is saying this, this day is like. We know the end. Like, we have gotten to the point in the game of solitaire where all the places are just going to go into the right spots. You just have to kind of go through the motions to put it there. I mean, that's how certain our future is. That's how certain the earth's future is because of the work that Jesus did on the cross and because of the resurrection. We can look forward to our future with just absolute certainty that we know how this is all going to play out. Man, that is so comforting. And so that is what he is saying here. Where all of this is headed is this day where the son hands over the keys of the kingdom to the father. And then we're all just, if God is all in all, and we're all worshiping, it's going to be awesome. But Paul doesn't leave us here. The final section we're about to read gives us the implications we have for our present, for our right now. So we're going to read the last little ch section here. This is verse 29. And he kind of goes back to that logic thing, right? Now, if there is no resurrection, what will we do for those who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised, why are people baptized for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I face death every day. Yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ our, Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought, and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. Okay, so there's a lot of different things going, going on here. The first chapter, or verse 29 Scholars have no idea what Paul's talking about. No one has ever figured out what he's talking about. There are like hundreds of theories, and every commentary I read was like, there are hundreds of theories, there's not even really a good guess. Um, some people are saying there's obviously some sort of ritual that was happening where maybe people were dying without being baptized, and so they would like either baptize them as they were dying, or like like in as after they had already died, or maybe like, you could be like a stand-in for someone that's already died, and you could get baptized and be on their hat. We have no idea. But either way, Paul is saying, why do this if, there, if you don't believe in a resurrection? So he's not, like, condemning this behavior or going that much into it. What he's saying is this thing that y'all are obviously doing that you obviously know what I'm talking about, Corinthians. Sorry, people, 2,000 years later. Uh, none of it matters if Christ has not been risen from the dead. So... The other thing that he says, I think we can understand, right? Verse 30, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? Paul faces death every day. He's constantly beaten. He's constantly thrown in jail. He's constantly put on trial. He does end up losing his life um, and is martyred for the gospel. And that's true of so many Christians, right? He makes this uh, reference to people fighting wild beasts in Ephesus, which means that only 20 years after Jesus had risen from the dead, it seems like they were putting Christians to death in arenas already in Ephesus. Um, and Paul's just saying, like, what the heck are all of us doing if we don't believe in a resurrection? Like, why would we risk our lives? And I hope that y'all think about this. When, when we have missionaries come and they talk about the work that they're doing in countries, I, I'm just like, oh my gosh. I mean, I think we all fall into that trap of thinking they're super Christians, right? Because we're like, I could never. I can't believe y'all are doing this. Um, they would say they're just normal people, and they're right. And the dif like not the difference, but but they just are really given the opportunity to live this out in a way that we're just not given the opportunity. Um, our lives are not at risk for following Jesus, um, but that's not true of brothers and sisters around the world. And so I think it's important when we read passages like that, we remember this is not something that was just happening two thousand years ago. Something that's happening right now, like today, in this second, as I'm talking. And Paul is saying, why would anyone risk their lives for something, for something that is just not true or just metaphorical? Uh, I talked to a couple of our college students um, before they went to college, and one of the pieces of advice I gave, gave them when they were looking for, they were saying, how do we find a new church? 
and you know lots of different things to look for but one thing I said is does the the pastor preach like he would he or she would risk their lives for this message and um, I, I hope that made an impact on the students because and I hope that's true for for me in court when we preach I would die for what I'm saying from the pulpit and if if someone would not then I think we should be we should be a little bit more critical of that um, and so I think that that's sort of what, what Paul is saying here. What, what, why would we risk our lives for a message that's untrue or one that's really an empty promise? It's just a logical, remember Paul last time we talked about the resurrection is something logical to believe in. And he's just saying, this is how that logic follows. There's a couple of things that he says um, towards the end. He's quoting some different, very well-known Greek philosophers. And you could see, right, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. I mean, that's, that's YOLO in ancient times, right? You only live once, so live it up, live for yourselves. Um, and, and then this other thing, too, bad company corrupts good character. And I want to end with this before we have some time for discussion. But I think what ultimately the resurrection means for us in the present is that, well, one, it reveals the character and nature of our God, right? That, that God is someone who values human life immensely, that values what we do in this life, um, you know, and, and also values what the next life is going to look like, right? Jesus tells his disciples, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And so there's one, uh, one of the commentators that I read says that we should be living in this world as those whose confidence in the final vindication of Christ through our own resurrection determines our present. Right? Our future hope that we have determines how we're going to live our life today. And um, it's actually, this is really fascinating, and I totally agree with this. It's a matter of sober historical record that slippage at this key point of Christian theology is very often accompanied by a relaxed attitude towards the Christian ethic. So let me rephrase that for us. If we start to slip in the seriousness and the reality of the resurrection of what Christ has done for us, it's gonna affect the way we live. It's gonna affect our Christian ethic. Um, you know, churches that do not, that are not as theologically robust, often are a lot more flexible on things they should not be flexible about. That's just a matter of fact. And so what Paul says, I just love it. It's, he's come back to your senses. Uh, and, and the way this Greek reads is like, like dumping cold water on someone who's, who's drunk or who, fought, who passed out after drinking. Like, sober up is seriously what Paul is saying here. Sober up. Come to your senses. Um, and stop sinning. Because this life does matter. Because the next one matters. And because one day we will all be submitted to the king of heaven. And we'll be living in this rule, and we'll be so glad about it. It's going to be awesome. And I, I think it's just interesting, and it's sort of a downer to end this passage on, I say this to your shame, but what Paul's going to talk about next week is going to wrap it all up, is that there is such a true hope. And, and next week we're going to really get into the technicalities, sort of, as much as we can, about what that final day will be like, about what life after life after death looks like. That's an N.T. right phrase. Life after, life after death. So we all have people in this room who have passed away and are with Jesus now. And there's a day coming where we will all, at the same time, with those who are asleep, as Paul says, we will, um, if we're still here, we may be asleep as well. There is a day coming that no one has experienced yet. And that is what we're looking forward to, to live in God's kingdom with new resurrected bodies um, who look way more like Christ than our, our first father, Adam. So that was a, that was a fire hose. Um, I'm going to give us some time to maybe discuss some of this at our tables, and y'all feel free if you've got any questions to grab me. I'm going to close us in prayer, and then y'all, um, I'll give you some discussion, some discussion points. So let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word and for the ways that you have just promised us and given us assurance of how this whole thing is going to go down. And Lord, we do not know the details. And we know that many, if not all of us in this room, will be um, 
deceased before you do come back. And yet we still hope in you and we still long for that day where you will return and make all things new, where you will release creation from its captivity. Um, and Lord, where we will have these bodies just like Jesus and we'll get to see him face to face. Lord, I pray that this would make all of us in this room feel lighter and excited and happy and joyful to be your children. Lord, we ask all this in your name. Amen. All right. Excuse me. Uh, there are several discussion questions. The first thing I'd love for y'all to do, I know I talked about this, but y'all talk about it at your table. What does it mean that Christ is the first fruits of resurrection? It's a weird term, so y'all talk about it. And then the other thing I really want to point out, number three, what's an if-then statement about the resurrection that applies to your own life? So if you can think of it this way, in the next 10 minutes, great. If not, um, like if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then I have no, and this is very personal, uh, I have no hope that I will ever see my third baby who is with Jesus ever again. I had a miscarriage last fall, if y'all didn't know. So if Jesus has not been raised from the dead, that's just a really awful thing that happened to me. And that's it. It's just really sad. But because I have hope in the resurrection, I know that death does not get the last word. And I get to see that baby again, and I get to live in that resurrection promise. So you don't have to go that deep in 10 minutes, but think about it. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, then what's the implication in your own life? And if you feel so bold, share that with some of your friends at the table. So y'all chat.